you are able to stand, would you stand for the reading of the Word of God this morning? Let's begin our message today by reading from James chapter 5, verses, verse 16. The Word of God says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we, we worship you. We glorify you. We thank you this morning for the privilege and the opportunity to stand before you and to worship you. What a joy it is to come and sing songs of praise. What a joy it is to stand here and know that we have been justified by your blood. So God, as we stand before you today, as we worship you, as we look at your word today, would you allow your spirit to fall on each of us? Would you allow your word to speak to us? Would you allow us to be transformed from within? Would you allow us to be made new inside? Would you work in our hearts so that we can hear your word, so that we can hear your voice today? We love you, Jesus. May you be honored in your holy name, I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, everybody. Man, it's good to see you all this morning. So today, as we continue in our series called Faith That Works, we are actually finishing this series by talking about a faith that works through prayer. And um, before we get into this, though, I want to mention to you that oftentimes when, when we start a relationship with God, when we have a communication or relationship with God, we forget that the essence of our relationship, the essence of our faith, the essence of, of this walk that we are having with God is really based on communication. I want you to think for a minute if you are married to somebody or, or, or if you have children, what would happen if you never talked to your husband or your wife? What would happen if you never talked to your children? Would that be a working relationship? It's just funny to think about it, but oftentimes we treat God in that sense. We say, you know what, I have been saved by His grace, but I don't need to talk to Him. I don't need to have a relationship with Him. So that's why this morning, as we look at these words, as we look at the, the Word of God, I want you to be attentive to what God has for you because you are in for a treat. And here's what I need you to do, okay? If you're my life point peeps, I need you to be awake, but I also need you to give the best cheer you have ever given to anybody to encourage Teen Challenge to come up. Okay, you guys ready for it? One, two, three, go! We're so blessed this morning. This is Pastor David, and he's going to share with you from the Word of God. Thanks, man. Thank you so much, Pastor, for having us. Man, I love that. I think we should just do that. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, thank you so much for having us. It is truly a privilege and honor to be able to be uh, in the house of the Lord. We are worshiping, and uh, man, I was in the Spirit and just feeling it. I'm like, man, this is so great. And I was like, I wonder who's going to speak Oh, man, I'm like, man, that was me, but uh, I love the flute, I, I love the, the saxophone, I love being able to worship with a body of believers. Uh, it's so good to be here. Uh, how many of you have never, ever heard of Teen Challenge before? Uh, just raise your hand. Okay, well, good, this is for you. Uh, the rest of them have heard it, and, and so uh, this is just us, and we appreciate that. And so Teen Challenge was started over 60 years ago. It is a discipleship that helps men, women, and teens with life-controlling addictions, anything that would separate you from God, being alcohol, depression, uh, drugs, suicide, video games, believe it or not, uh, anything that would separate you from God, we have a cure. Uh, his name is Jesus. That's right. Uh, it is a year-long residential program, but we have a documented 86% success rate. Hallelujah. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> Secular programs have about a 10 to 20% success rate, but that's because of Jesus. Uh, we don't have 12 steps. We have one. And so uh, what, what it is is that we have the opportunity to have the men at our center. We are an induction center. I'll tell you about all the centers here in Arizona. Uh, the first four months of their program, they spend with us. Uh, they live there. They eat there. They do their laundry there. Uh, they work there. Uh, then they go up to the ranch. Uh, the ranch is the Christian Life Ranch in New River, Arizona. Uh, that stands for the middle of nowhere on the north side of Phoenix. Uh, they spend seven months there. Then they go back to their respected induction centers for two more months, completing their third. 13 month long program. Uh, we also have another induction center in Phoenix called, uh, well, Phoenix at 1515 West Grand. Uh, we also have an amazing women's and children's home. 
Uh, and I emphasize the children because a lot of times when the women get help in our state or in the country, is, uh, they take the kids away from them. And we believe it's a process that they have to go through too, that they get the opportunity for healing and a relationship with Jesus too. And so it's actually called the Home of Hope. It's in Casa Grande. My lovely wife is a graduate from there uh, from a while ago, like 10 years. I don't even know now. Uh, but we are so thankful for that. And then we have our other program here in Tucson, the adolescent girls called Springboard. Uh, it's on the north side of Tucson from girls 12 to 17. But in Arizona, we can help all phases of life. That's what we want to do. We believe we have an answer. It's Jesus. They say we're faith-based, but we're more like faith-saturated. It's covered. It's, it's everything we do is all day long. They're going to get like six years of church uh, in one year. And so uh, it's like the pressure cooker of, of what we have. And some of them are like, yeah, we know. Uh, <laughs> They didn't maybe not know, but now they do. But uh, we're so glad for that. We are just one of many uh, centers. There are over 250 in the United States and over 1,200 around the world. And so they've been doing it for 60 years. Here in Arizona, we just celebrated 55 years of doing this. So it's a pretty big thing. Those of you that have never heard of it, I hope you have a, a little bit better of an idea. If you need more information, uh, Tom and Patrick would love to give that to you. We also have an amazing, an amazing, amazing thrift store here in Tucson. We had two of them, and one burned down. All right, it didn't burn down, but it came. It caught on fire in the building. Uh, we actually uh, rent from one of your congregation members' families, and uh, we are so uh, thankful for that. But we do have an amazing one still. Our home one is 2637 North Oracle. It is rated the number one thrift store in town. Yeah. My wife's the one that rated it, but it doesn't mean... <laughs> That it's not a really great program, uh, a really great uh, thrift store. And so please, if you're into thrifting, if you have donations, please uh, contact us. We would love to be able to uh, help you get some stuff and get rid of some stuff. If you've seen some of my guys in the black shirts, uh, they are the bouncers for today in security. No, I'm just kidding. They're a part of our Stay Sharp program. If you don't know what Stay Sharp is, it's a prevention awareness program where we go into schools, we go into youth groups, and we talk to kids about what our life choices have costed us, the things that almost cost us our life, our freedoms, our, our families, our money, our wealth, our health, uh, and we do prevention and awareness. And we don't go in as talking heads or uh, as being paid to be there, but as people who have uh, been in their shoes and have made those choices and it has affected our lives. And I'll tell you, the success rate, I feel like it's just gotten so much better. And I thought we were doing such a good job. I'm like, man, we're getting really good at this. Uh, and then God was like, hey, uh, dummy, uh, has nothing to do with you. And he didn't say dummy. Yeah, it was me. I said that. I said, hey, uh, he said, it's not because you're doing such a good job. It's because they're being exposed to it at such a younger age. And when today with social media in your hands and everything at your fingertips, they really are being exposed to it at such an early age. And that's why prevention awareness is so important. Uh, and they are actually doing that with your youth here right now. And so thank goodness uh, that we get that opportunity to do that. Uh, we have an awesome event coming up. How many of you have motorcycles? You <laughs> pastor, two, three. Uh, uh. All right, well, the rest of you are like me. Uh, I, I don't trust myself on a motorcycle. That's why I have a Prius. Uh, but uh, I just, if I have something that goes fast, I go fast. That's just what happens. And then I only have two wheels, and then when you wreck, it's... Anyways, but if you have one, we have what's called a bug splat run coming up on September 28th. It's this really cool thing. We give you a target. You get a bug splat on your target. You win a prize. Hopefully it's not, you know, here or maybe here or here, uh, but uh, it's an awesome event, a great opportunity for you to get involved with us. And that's my commercial. Now we get into the good stuff. They said that they overcame them by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. I tell you, I, every time I say this, and I go over it every single time we do this, but it's just so impressive to me. It just warms my heart to think that the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony could be in the same categories. Like, there is powerful. That's what overcame him. Him is a lowercase h. That means the devil. So we overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And so all these men here today have a testimony. You have a testimony. We all have a testimony. But what are you doing with that testimony? And how did you get there? I would say that prayer is a big part of that. How many of you had someone praying for you? Raise your hand. 
Well, that, yeah, that was for them, but yeah, it was good. I'm glad. It's even better that you had someone praying for you. We all had someone praying for us, and uh, I'm just going to show you some of that today. And this is the part of the program that actually increases their prayer life. Uh, it goes like this. Uh, Dear God, uh, please don't let him pick me. No, I'm just kidding. Hey, let me get Joseph Smith and Dean. Uh, this is not the founder of the Mormons. Uh, this is just a coincidence. I, uh, uh, <laughs> It'd be really great if it was, uh, but it, it's not. It's okay. Uh, it, this is Joseph. <laughs> he, he's been... Uh... <laughs> that prayer was for everyone except for Joseph. He has wanted to do this for a while, and so we are so excited to have him, man. But hey, uh, we know who you are. Where are you from, man? San Diego, California. San Diego, California. Hey, uh, that doesn't make him a bad person. I don't know why. Nobody, <laughs> nobody cheered for that. It was twice. It was, anyways, uh, hey, Joe, man, what did it look like before Teen Challenge? Gangs, drugs, prison, and the streets. Joe, uh, who was praying for you? My father. He's a pastor. Now that you've been in Teen Challenge, what, what, what has happened in your life? Um. Well, I had a hospital injury last year as a result of my addiction. I had spinal surgery because I had developed an abscess. And um, for the past year, I've been walking like this, you know, even on opiates. And um, since I've been in Teen Challenge, I haven't taken any pain meds, and I've never walked straighter in my life. Um, I got a, my anxiety, my depression, all that other stuff is pretty much gone. And I got a relationship with a, a new father, too, who, who cares about me. What does that relationship look like? <laughs> How's the relationship with your father, man? Well, with um, my earthly father, it's developing. We're like getting to know each other now for the first time. The day he brought me over here was the first time I'd seen him in 13 years. Um, and the father, the relationship I'm developing with God is um, it's amazing, man. It's, uh, I catch myself just sitting in bed by myself and just talking out loud to him. And it's something I've never done before, never believed in. Joe, what would you tell someone who was praying for someone? Don't stop. It took my dad about... Well, it didn't take my dad. It took me about 15 years before I got my head out of, you know, my, my rear and, de <laughs> and decided to, to come back <laughs> and decided to, sorry, still working on things, uh, <laughs> and decided to finally, you know, uh, let somebody else drive. Uh. Like, we get so stuck in our thoughts thinking that we can know how to drive the car, and if, even after wreck after wreck, you know, and uh, just don't stop. Just keep praying for them because it works. Man. Hey, thank you, Joe. Thank you. Never shocked at all by what's said. Just kidding. Uh, man, man, hey, who are you? Where are you from? My name is Dion, and I'm from Tucson. Yeah. I saved the Tucson guy for the second one because they always cheer for that. I don't know. We'll have to work on that when they're from other places, man. But Dion, hey, what did it look like before Teen Challenge? Oh, man. Uh, I could just tell you just, uh, just broken, lost, uh, just really just empty inside, just no purpose, feeling no, you know, I had no purpose, and uh, that's, that's where I was before. Hey, Dion, who, who was praying for you? <laughs> My mom, so watch out if you got a mother out there <laughs> praying for you. <laughs> if you got a grandma praying for you, just wrap it up, yeah. it's over. Uh, what was mom praying, or how did that happen? Well, so pretty much uh, a few months before I came to the program uh, the first time, uh, my mom had got saved um, from a neighbor sharing Christ with her, and then uh, she started praying for me, and I just got to a really dark place. I came to Teen Challenge um, the third month of 2016, and I remember John 3:16, for God so loved the world, and I got saved the first day that I came into the program on my mom's birthday. <laughs> yeah, it was just pretty good. We could just stop there, mic drop, walk off. No. Hey, uh, Dion, what has God done in your life since coming back into Teen Challenge? Oh, wow. I, can, I mean, I could go on all day, but um, pretty much he's showed me who I am and who he's created me to be. And... Um, you know, showing my identity in him, and really that's allowed me to uh, love myself, which is crazy. I was saying it the other day, I'm like telling people like, wow, I can say that I love myself now mm -hmm. because he loved me first, and 
Oh uh, man, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah. Hey, thank you, Dion. Thank you. I'm gonna brag on that young man for a minute. He was here in Tucson, and he was uh, been through the program, but he had fallen off and was lost. Was on the south side of Tucson, and uh, he said he needed to feel some love and get some prayer. And so he walked from the south side of Tucson to our center and had our guys pray for him and love on him. And at that moment, they're praying for him. They're all gathered, and I got this guy, Phil. He's a bit eccentric, and he's yelling Bible verses and going at it. And, and like at that moment, another guy comes out of his room. He's like, I was just reading that in my Bible. But the faith and the prayer, uh, did you get faith in prayer? Did you get prayer when you came in? Did you get love? <laughs> <laughs> that's when he truly experienced the love of God coming back. I, I say that's such an encouraging word, and that's what we're going to talk about today uh, in that scripture of James five thirteen through 20. There is a heading, there's a title, and it is the prayer of faith. I always read those uh, paragraph headings that gives you a help, a little understanding to know more. I think who wrote it and who they're writing to is the next thing, but, but understanding that top paragraph is so important. And I'm going to read this verse, and then I'm going to pray, and we're going to hear the word of God for a moment. And so, James five thirteen to 20. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Amen. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man, of a person, is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, and even as we are, he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain in the land for three and a half years, and again he prayed, and the, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the air of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Let's pray. Dearly Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you that it never returns void, Father God. I pray that you would just help encourage us today, that you would give us some tools, that you would speak to us in that individual way that you do, God. We're so thankful for prayer, Father. We're so thankful for our faith, Father. May we be able to have a prayer of faith today. In Jesus' name, amen. I love this passage. I think that this is like the ideal version of what happens to somebody before they come to Teen Challenge. That somebody was praying for them, that they had the faith that they were praying for themselves. They may not even know what it looked like, but they were praying and they needed that faith. And in that first little bit of pasture, we want us to look at those first three verses. Uh, it says, is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is any happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to be prayed over and then anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the power or the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. And if they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. My first point for you today is that you can't keep it in the dark. You can't keep those things in your life in the dark. You can't let them define you. You have to be able to speak them out and get them out. In Teen Challenge, we believe that if you really, really knew someone, like if you really, really knew everything about someone, how they grew up, where they grew up, who they grew up with, their successes, their failures, there is no way that you couldn't love them. But unfortunately, in today's society, in our world, we believe that if you knew the real me, you would neither love me nor accept me. Isn't that an interesting thought to think that if you really knew someone, our fear is that you wouldn't love them or accept them and I'm here to tell you the more I hear these guys stories the more that we confess those things the more that we talk about those things the more that we don't keep those things in the dark the more that I love them in John 1 John 1 8 through 10 it says if we claim to be without sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us 
If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. See, the reality is we all have sin. We all fall short in those things. But what are you doing with it? See, the devil wants to tempt you and accuse you with those things. And the longer you keep those in the closet, the longer you keep those things in the dark, he's going to remind you of those things every time. Yeah, but you do this. What, a, what about that? Yeah, well, you have said this. See, the thing is, is that we all fall short, but we have this idea that if you really, really knew me, you wouldn't love me nor accept me. And I'm here to tell you that the more that you know someone, the more that you really, really know someone, there is no way that you couldn't love them. You have to get that stuff out. Find someone that you can speak those things out. Every day we have a process called evaluation where the guys are able to evaluate themselves. We no longer control performance or, or change in the program with punishment and discipline. We do it with an opportunity of, of a positive affirmation, of, of speaking these things out. See, Jesus never drove out darkness with darkness. He only did it with light. So what are you doing with those things? Who are you confessing those things to so that you may be healed? And that second part of that verse is James 5, 17 through 18. Elijah was a human being even as we are. I always love that, that he just comforts us that it's possible for you. That Jesus, he, Jesus was God, but, but this guy, Elijah, was just like you and me and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. I don't advise that in Arizona. Uh, we need all the rain we can get. Although I have a few holes in my roof, and so I please don't let it leak in my holes. But he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it didn't rain for three and a half years. And again, he prayed to the heavens, gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. See, you have to pray these things out. He, he didn't want rain, and so he prayed, and God didn't give him rain, and then he prayed for rain, and God gave those rain. And so when I heard this message, I was thinking of the prayer of faith, and, and the first person that came to my mind was my father. Someone who prayed for me. My room used to be above his prayer room, his Bible room, and I would hear him up there sob, crying, praying, and I used to think, there is no hope for me, Dad. I'm a heroin addict. I'm lost. Just give it up. But through his prayers and the Holy Spirit have led to my deliverance. That's Philippians 119. That is a bonus verse. It's not up there. <laughs> but I was thinking about it, and I always like to tease my dad that I'm going to have him come up and speak. And right when we pulled up, I said, are you ready for today? He's like, what? I'm like, I'll have you come up with me. He doesn't want to come up. So he uh, is going to answer some questions. He, I've already asked him these questions, and we went over them, and we talked about it. Uh, after the first service, I joked with him. I said, I, I, I did that one. You're going to do the next one. Uh, but what he said to me was really powerful, and I wanted to share that with you today. I, I asked him, I said, Dad, why did you pray for me? Well, why? He said, I had to do it to get something to happen because what I was doing wasn't working. He said, I said, well, why, what did you think would happen? He said, I believed in a miracle. See, we try to do things on our own. We, we try to make things happen. We try to do it on our own willpower and, and then we forget about God. He said, I was trying everything. He said, I knew the only way to make it happen was to pray to God. He said, because he couldn't do it. I think we learn from Jesus' prayer to God before he was crucified. He said, if possible, God, take this from me. He knew what was about to come, but he said the next most important part, he said, not my will, but your will be done. Are your prayers requests or demands upon God? Or are they praying them out that God would have his direction, his path, what he wants done? I said, Dad, what did you think would happen? He said, I believed in a miracle. 
I said, well, Dad, wh- where did you learn that from? His mother, my grandma was a, a praying grandma and mom. I told you if you have a grandma praying for you, wrap it up, just give it up, it's over. But he also said his pastor, Pastor Eastwood, I, I've heard about Pastor Eastwood my whole life. He was so in, influential in my dad's life that he gave him the credit for learning where to pray for and have miracles. Be thankful today that you have a pastor who who has direction, who follows the word and believes in those miracles. May you learn from his faith in prayer for miracles. May we be the parents that teach our kids. If you didn't have that parent, I'm so sorry, but, but may you be the one that sets that tone. Men, you are going to break that generational curse and be that prayer warrior that you're going to believe in faith and miracles because you have been set free and you are a miracle yourself. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. It says, Rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. I went through the Peoria, Illinois Teen Challenge 12 years ago, and before every meal, we would have to say the last part of this verse. It's funny to learn the different cultures and uh, different teen challenges. I met a gentleman from the El Paso Teen Challenge. Uh, it was so awesome to hear his Noah story. And, and I look over here when we were after service, and it says, and everything give thanks. It's right on your wall. And so before every meal, we would have to say that, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God, and Christ Jesus concerning you. I think for a while I couldn't even eat unless I repeated that verse to myself. Uh, I had got so accustomed. Now we have a bell. We ring the bell. I, I can't even eat anything unless you ring a bell. But the first two things in this verse are so important and I don't want you to look them over or pass over them. It says rejoice always. Rejoice always. And I'm here to tell you that your attitude, your perception will determine your altitude and where it goes. If you're like, oh God, why did this happen to me? Or God, thank you for letting this happen. You have to rejoice in all things and then you have to pray continually. I constantly am praying, and I, and I don't have to, oh, where is thou, God? Speak to me, and right here. It's a constant thing. Pray continually, going over it and over in your head. Give thanks in all things. Do you know what the Greek word is for all? Oh, that's good, I'm glad. It's all. <laughs> it's everything. May, may you pray and may you give thanks in all normally someone blurts that out it was, it was impressive uh, but uh, I, may you give thanks in all things for God's will for you not your will but my will you have to pray those things out God I'm bringing this to your attention this is the problem this is the situation I'm giving this to you Father may your will not my will be done He said, I I couldn't do it, but I knew he could. Are you thanking God for losing your job? Whoa. Are you saying, God, thank you for a new way to provide for my family? Thank you for allowing me to work somewhere else. Thank you for helping me with my patience for Brother Brillopad. You don't have to call him Brother Billopad. But thank you that you're growing me in patience. What is that thing that he's teaching and showing you? You have to pray those things out. In that last section of verse, it says, James 5, 19 through 20, my brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their ways will save them from the death and cover over a multitude of sins. To cover over a multitude of sins. I think of the going after the one in Matthew 18, 12 through 14. What do you think if a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away? Will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go and look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about the one sheep, about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. 
We have to remember that it's not about all those people who are, are here or doing health all the time. It's about those sick. It's about those ones that wander off. You think about little bull peep, a shepherd. I have like a, an image in my head with a big white dress and, like the, and the staff. But this isn't really a staff. It's called a crook. Not the guy that ripped you off. This is called a crook, and it's a long staff, and it has a big old hook on it, and it was designed for, one, fending off enemies, and two, to reach out and pull them back. May we have the heart of the Father that, that none would perish. May we go after that one. Thank goodness that someone went after us. Even when I had given up on myself, God didn't give up on me. See, the most difficult cases, the hardest people, the, the most unforeseen circumstances becomes God's biggest miracles. But don't keep those things in the dark. And you have to pray those things out. And may you go after the one. We have a word, it's called accountability, and we, we, we changed the word from accountability because we thought of like cops uh, writing us up or giving us tickets uh, or, or something uh, derogatory. But what we, what we wanted to change it to was protective love. May you have protective love for others. May you have that shepherd's heart to go after that 99, uh, leave the 99 for the one. May you have that heart of going after the one. I think of football when I think of protective love. It's football season, preseason just, but it's fine. I am a sports fanatic, and so I, I can't even help but relate things to these. And I think of offensive linemen as they, as they guard and protect their quarterback, Michael Orr, from the Panthers, the movie Blindside. He, they found out that it was worth investing more money into those that protected their quarterback and running back than the defensive players. May we have that same thing for the people in our congregation that are wandering off path or, or people are trying to attack them. May we block May we have that protective love. May we protect that one. And so today I would say to you those things that you don't have to keep it in the dark. If you want to be healed, may you confess those things so that you may be healed. May you pray it out. May you have faith to see that prayer through. And the last one, may you go after the one. I love this analogy, and I'm going to turn it over to Pastor after this. There was this guy, and he was trapped in a hole, and, and he was trying everything to get out of it, and he was scratching and clawing and jumping, and, and he couldn't get out, and this guy was walking by. He's like, hey, help me, man. And the guy jumps in the hole. He's like, dude, what are you doing? He's like, now we're both trapped in here. He said, relax. I know the way out. May your testimony, may be the things that you've seen miracles in, be that way out for someone else. You men are a way out for other people who are lost in bondage to addiction and, and their lives being torn apart. And if it wasn't for people like my father who prayed faithfully, I wouldn't have known where to turn to. And so my question for you today is, what do you need to pray about? What do you need to give to him? What do you need to get out of the dark? Because God wants to go after you. Thank you so much for having us. We love you guys. Man, I love it. I love it. You know, I am not one of those of you who know me. I'm not one of those people who just allow anybody to come and speak. But I believe in the ministry of Teen Challenge in a broken community, in a broken nation, in a broken country, in a broken world where addiction is so prevalent, when it's so real, these people do things that we are unable to do. And I encourage you to get to know more about Teen Challenge. I, I, I challenge you to support them. There is a table out there for you guys to get more information. You can give them a love offering. If God puts it in your heart, just bless them with some finances or something. Just bless them that way participate in this ministry I want to send you off I want to send you off with this isn't it interesting in Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10 most of you when you were led to Christ you read these verses somebody read these for you or you read them out loud and it says in verse 9 it says if you declare with your mouth what is the word there again if you declare with your mouth 
Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised them from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your, what is the word? Mouth. That you profess your faith and are saved. Isn't it interesting? That the beginning of your relationship with God begins with words. Begins with prayer. Yet somewhere along the line, you get saved, you find Jesus, Jesus finds you, you find redemption, you find hope, and then somewhere along the line, that conversation stops. You see, you create for yourself a place of, of prayer. You come and say, you know what, I'm going to spend some time with God. I'm going to come to my prayer table. I'm going to sit there and I'm going to pray. And as you come right there, you're just, you're like excited. God is going to do something. And then as you come, and all of a sudden your phone rings. Okay, you answer it. You answer the text. And then I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray, okay? I'm going to pray. Hold on. Oh, look at Facebook. Oh, there's a notification. Did she just go on vacation? I'm going to pray, God. Hold on a second. I'm going to pray. Did, did he just buy a new car? Man, that looks nice. I'm going to pray. Okay. My goodness. Look at her hair. I, I'm going to pray, God. I'm going to pray. And before you know it, there is this distance. That clutter that has been created. And as time goes by, this relationship is so damaged. It's so damaged that you come to yourself and James comes and says, prayer of a righteous person is effective and powerful. And you say, but I'm not that righteous person. I can't pray to God. Did you know that as a pastor, most of the relationships I see broken, husbands and wives that have stopped communicating with each other and they say, you know what? She will never understand me because you will never communicate. Or parents and children say, you know what, my dad will never get it, my mom will never get it, because there is no communication. There's that clutter. There's that mess. And James comes, James comes and says, the prayer of a righteous person, I am not righteous. <laughs> Good thing you're not. Because then the word of God comes and says, it is by the blood of Jesus Christ that you have been justified, that you have been made righteous. So when Father hears you, he doesn't hear you. He hears his son speaking through you. You have been justified. You may be nasty. You may be filthy. You may have been walking away from God. But God says, you know what? When you come to me, I will hear you. I will listen. I know sometimes you get spoiled because somebody else keeps praying for you. And this morning, I'm not going to end the service with prayer for you. I usually pray for you at the end of the service. But instead, I'm going to ask you to pray. Some of you have allowed this clutter to build up. Some of you have gone so far. But today is the day you come near. Today is the day you say, you know what? I'm going to set aside everything that is in the middle of my relationship. I'm going to come to Jesus. I'm going to kneel. I'm going to raise my hands. I am going to worship. I am going to pray. I am going to fix this relationship today. I want to finish with this. King David prayed this when he was in the same situation. When he couldn't, he couldn't continue on. He prayed this because he knew he was walking away. I want you to stand up for this if you're able to. Prayer team members, would you surround the room? If you're in a place that you just don't have the words to pray, come pray with one of our prayer team members. But don't be spoiled. Don't let always somebody else to pray for you. King David said in Psalm 143, he says, Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my cry for mercy. In your faithfulness and righteousness, come to my relief. Do not bring your servant into judgment, for no one living is righteous before you. The enemy pursues me. He crushes me to the ground. He makes me dwell in the darkness like those long dead. So my spirit grows faint within me. My heart within me is dismayed, but it's okay because I remember. I remember the days of long ago. I remember how you saved me, God. I remember how you came to my rescue. I meditate on all your works and consider what your hands have done in my life, Jesus. 
I spread out my hands to you. I thirst for you like a parched land. I thirst for you like a parched land. God, I thirst for you. As Rick leads us in the last song, if the Spirit of God leads you to come kneel before His presence, would you kneel before Him? If the Spirit of God leads you to raise your hands, would you raise your hands? If the Spirit of God is leading you, pray today. Restore that relationship.